Now, uh, I've been doing this mostly on Sunday nights, but I'm going to continue the series I've been doing, teaching on leadership qualities. And there's been, we've done uh, two, I've done two sermons so far on various qualities that are good for leaders to have. We need more good leadership, in, uh, especially in, in good churches where there's people who are proclaiming the word of God. And a lot of the qualities I've been teaching on have been, they're applicable outside of just church leadership, right? The things that we're, we're, we're looking at and understanding, they're characteristics that make people good leaders. And this is applicable in many areas of life, in any area that you want to be a good leader. It could work on the job, just in your life, at home. You know, there, there's many areas to kind of lead. And, and um, what I'm teaching on this morning is also going to be helpful, even, you know, even though it is a good attribute, a, a good strong quality for good leaders to have, if you say, well, I'm never going to be in a position of any type of leadership, that's fine. You can still learn this principle because of the, the topic that we're covering today, the leadership quality that I'm teaching on, is being apt to teach or being able to teach, being a good teacher, being a good instructor. Now, this is applicable to everybody to some degree because we all, as believers in Jesus Christ, should at the very least, the very minimum, be able to teach other people how to be saved, be able to show someone how to be saved. So this is going to be applicable all across the board. And like I said, that's at a very minimum. We usually have other people, I mean, being able to disciple people, right? Converts, not just leading them to Christ, but then being able to continue to work with them after that to teach them, instruct them, and try to teach them in the ways of the Lord. And again, this is a very uh, spiritual base, but we're in church, so I'm going to be making most of my applications today, not for how you can apply this outside of church, but how this is going to be applicable within church. Jesus is in the Great Commission in Matthew 28. You don't have to turn there. The Bible said, Jesus said, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. So being able to teach other people is a very important part of that Great Commission, going out and preaching the gospel, teaching all nations. And it's not just teaching them how to be saved. He says, Teach them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. Basically, we're teaching them the Bible. We're teaching them everything. That's what we're supposed to do. We want to be able to teach the Bible. The Bible says in 1 Timothy 3, uh, the qualifications for a pastor is, a pastor is, you know, obviously a leader, should be a leader in the church. They have a leadership role. And the pastor needs to be apt to teach. Verse number two of 1 Timothy 3 says, A bishop then must be blameless, a husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach. It means apt means you have the ability to, you have the aptitude to be able to teach other people. And if you're looking to one day maybe become a pastor yourself, any of you young men, then you need to make sure that you are apt to teach. Now we started off in Nehemiah chapter 8. And we see that this is, I brought this up in our Wednesday night Bible study previously, but in Nehemiah chapter 8, we see basically God's word being opened up. We've got Ezra standing on a pulpit, and a pulpit wasn't like this, it was just a raised platform for him to stand up and that his words can be heard out into the audience because there's a lot of people congregated together, a lot of people gathered together to hear the word of the Lord. And he's, he's proclaiming the word of the Lord. As soon as he goes open up the Bible, everybody stands up out of respect for the word of God. And you know, that this isn't what I'm teaching on, but just as a side note, that's how people came prepared to hear and learn from the word of God, is that they start off just by showing respect. And you know, when we come to church, when we show up to hear the preaching, your heart ought to be in that position of, this is God's word. We respect the word of God. We want to hear what we need. You know, this should be exalted. And we come ready to hear what more can I learn today from God's word? What more can I just glean from the word of God to be able to apply in my life to, uh, to just know God better, to, to live better, and, and to change my life? We come to church to hear from God's word in order to change. We don't want to come in here and just leave exactly the same. What's the point of hearing all of this stuff and reading this book if nothing ever changes in your life? 
unless you're Jesus Christ, okay, you're not perfect. Everybody needs areas that you need to improve upon. And, um, and, you know, and, and hopefully you're coming with at least a humble enough attitude to recognize that. Now, not everything that I say may be true out of my own opinion or out of my own mouth, but that's why I go to a lot of Scripture. <laughs> because even if I'm wrong about something, you're, hopefully you can walk away learning something just based off of the sheer amount of Bible that we're going to be reading today. Now, obviously, I don't think that I'm wrong about this. Otherwise, I wouldn't be teaching this. And this is a very simple topic anyways. But let's look here. We're going to reread part of Nehemiah chapter 8. Look at verse number 5. The Bible says, And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God. And all the people answered, Amen, Amen, with lifting up their hands. And they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. So you see the humility in their attitude. Verse number seven, and Jeshua and Bani and Sherebiah and Jamin, Akab, Sheb Shabbatai, Hodijah, Maasiah, Kalita, Azariah, Josabad, Hanan, Peliah, and the Levites caused the people to understand the law. And the people stood in their place. So their job here is to cause the people, they're teaching the people to understand God's law. That was their job as leaders within this church, within this congregation that we see in Nehemiah chapter 8. Their job is to cause the people to understand. It's not enough just to read. They have to also provide understanding to God's law. Verse number 8, it says, So they read in the book, in the law of God, distinctly and gave the sense. You know, people want to complain, and you hear this more and more frequently of people who say, I don't need to go to church. I don't need some man to tell me what the Bible says. I could just read the Bible for myself. I could sit at home and pray. I could sing songs at home. I can do all of this stuff at home. What do I need to go to church for? And most of the people like that already have a proud attitude, and they'll say, you know what? I know more than these pastors anyway. I read my Bible. I know this, and I know that more. Yeah, you don't even know the basics. You don't even know that God commands you to be in church. You can't even see the qualifications are given for an elder, for a bishop, for a deacon. You people who want to just say, oh, I don't need to go to church. Where's your deacon? At home. Who's the bishop? These are offices, according to Scripture, that have qualifications that need to be met before you could even have somebody in that office. Why would God waste his breath on this stuff in the New Testament if you don't really need it anyways? It's nonsense. So we need to be ready to hear and ready to learn and ready to listen. And we see the example being played out perfectly in Nehemiah chapter 8, saying they read in the book of the law. We don't just come together, just read the Bible, and then just go home and, and there's no explanation given there's no understanding there's no sense being given to the words no it needs to be given it needs to be applied it needs to be shown okay here's what god's word says and this is what it means in your life and this is exactly what they did verse number eight says so they read in the book of the law of god distinctly and gave the sense and caused them to understand the reading now i'm not god's word isn't overly complicated and difficult but it does, it does need for people to just hear things spelled out, I mean, at the bottom level of just, this is exactly what this means. Okay, when the Bible says this, you know, when it says not to steal, well, obviously we know you don't go and take something that belongs to someone else, but where more of the sense can be given is you could say, well, stealing isn't just grabbing something from a store and walking out without paying for it how about when you're at work and you're being paid to do a job and you start just doing your own stuff and using your own time to you know to, uh, on the, the company time you're getting paid to do a work you're not doing that work you're doing something else you know that that's one very simple example of how the understanding is given how the 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 sense and people are caused to understand, well, what does this actually mean? What are the implications of this? How far spreading is this? And then in verse number nine, it says, And Nehemiah, which is the Tirshatha, and Ezra the priest, the scribe, and the Levites that taught the people, said unto all the people, This day is holy unto the Lord your God. Mourn not, nor weep. For all the people wept, 
when they heard the words of the law. So they're teaching the Bible and, and the people started to get upset and to weep and they're saying, wait, don't cry. And hopefully you don't come here sad and mourning like, oh man, what's he going to say today? What is God? <laughs> it's a good thing to hear the law of the Lord. Now you may get convicted. You may, you may, you, you know, something might be hit on that hurts. It hits home because you're guilty of something. And that was the case here. I mean, these people were guilty of stuff especially at this time when they're coming back from captivity, when they're, when they're finally starting to get back right with God, they have not been right with God for a long, long, for decades. The children of Israel just, just as a people had strayed away. They started worshiping false gods and now they're hearing. So Ezra's got the book open and they're just reading out the law of God and people are just realizing Wow, we have been in some serious sin. And they start weeping and mourning over it. And he says, look, you, you've been guilty, but look, we're getting back to the word of God. This is, this is a joyous thing. This is a holy day. This is a good thing. We're getting on the right path. Their hearts have been humbled. Now we're moving forward. And I'll say this this morning. You know, everybody has a past. Everybody has history. Everybody's done things that you're not very proud of. And I'm not saying you should just ignore those things. You know, when you find out you're guilty of something, there's nothing wrong with being, you know, sad about it or mournful about it. But don't let that bring you down. Once you realize that, you know, you got to realize this is a good thing. I'm going to move forward with this now. I'm going to confess and forsake my sin to God and not do that anymore. But, but use that as, as, a, as a good thing. When you learn, especially when you learn something new, you hear from God's law. Wow, I didn't know I was doing that. I can't believe that. I'm sorry I was doing that, but I'm going to move forward now. We're going to move ahead. And um, so anyways, I'm getting a little bit off subject here. Turn, to, if you would, to, uh, to Acts chapter 4. get back into some of the leadership qualities. You need to be apt to teach. We see teachers in Scripture. We see the teachers. The Levites were teachers of God's Word. Also in 1 Timothy chapter 3, we saw, of course, earlier in the qualifications that a, a bishop needs to be apt to teach. But another one of the qualifications is that they're not a novice. A novice means a newbie, a, a beginner, someone who's new at doing that, you know, someone who's inexperienced. And that actually just makes common sense if you think about it. If you want to be able to teach something and instruct other people how to do something, whatever it is, anything, if you're going to be a teacher at something, you can't just be brand new to it. You have to you know, learn it and know it in order to teach it unto others. I mean, think about, you know, if you think back to maybe sometime when you're in school, you're, you're learning something new. What about the very first day you, you, you learn something or maybe you start to understand something? There's a big difference between getting it and just finally understanding it and then being able to just explain it completely to somebody else. I mean, I remember the, with the day I got saved, it was great. I understood salvation. I understood what it took to be saved, but I wasn't very good at being able to explain that to someone else and to teach someone else how to be saved. Now, it's not that you can't do it, but it's a lot more difficult, right? And um, it, it takes time and practice to be able to get better and better at something, to be able to really be good at teaching something. You just learn a brand new doctrine from the Bible, and you can see, yes, that's true. You go to church and, wow, that's cool. I never saw that before. It's a whole other thing to be able to go and turn around and then teach that and remember all the places and be able to to explain why everything fits together perfectly from the Bible. That requires a lot more um, substance, a lot more knowledge. Acts chapter 4, look at verse number 1. We're going to see, And as they spake unto the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. Now this is talking about the apostles the disciples teaching and, and getting people saved in the book, of, the book of Acts. And of course, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they don't like that. They don't like that they're going around and teaching the people. Now, even though the Bible says 
that you don't have to be a novice. One of the reasons why we're turning this passage, what I want to show you, is that the disciples and the apostles, they weren't novices. They weren't beginners at teaching God's word. But you know what? They also weren't Bible college grads. They didn't have to have some, you know, degree from some institute in order to teach other people. And this is, this is what drives me nuts. We live in a society where people, even just as secular in the, in the world, just think, well, you have to have a college degree to get a job. Or you, you know, you, you're not qualified if you don't have a college degree. As if that's just the be all end all of anything. As if you can't learn something and understand something and be good at something unless you go to this school. Like that's ridiculous. Most people, most professionals will tell you that you know, they may say college is okay or whatever, that they may have learned some good things, but what you really learn, you learn on the job. What, what the things that really matter, that really benefit what you do and that make you better at what you do, you learn those things through working at it, through the experience. I have a computer science degree that I, that I earned at a, a four-year university. And what I learned there compared to what I've learned in my career, it, it, the, the college doesn't even hold a candle to what I, I've learned through doing and working. And if I had more wisdom back then, I wouldn't have even gone and gotten the stupid degree. I could have spent the same four years just focused on and working on uh, you know, doing the work that would have gotten me way farther ahead and even more valuable to companies or to anybody to do this type of business, you know, do that type of work than just coming straight out of school and having almost no type of uh, experience. And so when we say here that someone needs to be not a novice, that's not saying you have, again, it's not, it's not just putting some artificial, you know, college degree on something, but it does mean you still have to know what you're doing. I mean, I'm the pastor of this church. I don't have a Bible college degree. But that doesn't make me a beginner. That doesn't mean I, I, I haven't already studied and learned and trained and was taught under teaching to, you know, to get to the point to where I'm at to be able to teach other people. But let's keep reading here because this is the perception, though, that the Pharisees and the Sadducees had we're going to see what the way that they thought about the disciples, about the apostles, because they're going around and teaching people. And, I, and mind you, they're teaching people very effectively. The Bible says they're turning the world upside down with their doctrine. I mean, they're having a serious impact on the people that they're, they're talking to and they're preaching to. Uh, let's keep reading. Verse number three says, And they laid hands on them and put them in hold un unto the next day, for it was now eventide. So they arrested them and threw them in prison. Howbeit many of them which heard the word believed, and the number of the men was about 5,000. And it came to pass on the morrow that the rulers and elders and scribes and Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and as many as were of the kindred of the high priest were gathered together at Jerusalem. And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, By what power, or by what mean, by what name have you done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man, by what means he is made whole, be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him that this man stand here before you whole. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. So what we see here is Peter. Now he spent, he was a fisherman. When Jesus came on the scene, he was a blue collar worker out in his boat and fishing. He wasn't some college educated guy. He didn't grow up in a family that had him in school and, and, you know, and learning all this stuff. He was working. He was considered to be an ignorant person, not well-educated. But after three and a half years of spending time with Christ and being taught under his ministry and learning and growing and doing, not just sitting at his feet and just listening and that's it. No, they were, they were getting on-the-job training, going out, preaching the gospel, preaching to people, all the while receiving instruction. Now he's at the point in Acts chapter 4, I mean, he's bold. When they came to arrest Jesus, you know, yeah, he pulled out his sword, but then he ended up running away. 
And then when they brought him in to, uh, to the judgment hall, you know, he's, he's way back. He doesn't even want people to know. He's, he's, he kind of wants to see what's going on. But he's not very bold at all, even to the point to where, you know, a young lady asks him, hey, weren't, aren't you friends with him? Don't you know him? And he's like, no, no. And he starts lying to like a little girl, a young lady. From that now to the point where he's being arrested, they're bringing him before the high priest, and they're basically, you know, didn't we tell you not to teach you this name? He says, look, if you guys want to know like, how this guy was, was healed, be it known unto all of you that, that Jesus, whom ye crucified, he's calling them the murderers. God raised him from the dead, you know, and, and you guys are wicked, you're wrong, and, and he has this boldness to just, to just preach this unto them. And, uh, and boldly just say, you know, Jesus is the Savior and that they wickedly crucified him. But look at what verse 13 says. It says, now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men. So this is a perception of them. They're unlearned. They're ignorant. They're not very smart people. It says they marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. They became apt to teach not because they were learned men. Not because they studied all the wisdom of the world. They became, learned, they be, they became teachers and able to teach and get this boldness because they spent time with Jesus. And if you spend time with Jesus, if you spend time in God's word, if you spend time in God's house, you can be apt to teach also. You can be able to, to gain that knowledge and that information. And it doesn't matter if you're unlearned and ignorant. You can get the boldness from the Holy Ghost. You can get the teaching and the wisdom and the knowledge that you need in order to teach others the same also. So don't think that this is some special gift that you have to have in order to be successful at this. We're looking at leadership qualities, apt to teach, being able to teach. Spend some time with Jesus. He'll help you. Spend some time out soul winning. That will help you in and of itself. And again, the skills that you can learn of figuring out how to teach things to people can be applied in many other areas. Focus in on the one. You say, I'm not very good at explaining things to people. Go out soul winning and just get really good at figuring out how to teach people how to be saved. Because when you go out and preach the gospel, there are many ways that you can help people to understand. And you're going to be even a more effective soul winner the more ways you can figure out how to get that understanding across to people. Now, we dead sure use the Bible when we're out preaching the gospel to people because the Bible says that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God, that it's God's word. It's the incorruptible seed that's going to bring forth that new life. You have to use God's word. God's word ultimately is going to pierce through the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. That's where the power is. But at the same time, you still need to have somebody to help to give the understanding of God's word in conjunction with God's word. People don't just get saved by reading the Bible on their own. I mean, that's evidenced in Acts chapter 8. The Ethiopian eunuch was reading God's word and specifically reading a passage that had to do with Jesus Christ being sacrificed and he had no idea what he was talking about because the natural man receiveth not the things of God. You need to have someone there to help teach you. And that's where the soul winner comes in. That's where the human instrument comes in that God has committed unto us, the ministry of reconciliation, so we can reconcile people unto God through Jesus Christ. So we have to go out and explain to people. And the concepts are very simple. But when you, when you become apt to teach, you're taking something that, that's either you know, complicated or even not that difficult and just making it so that that person can understand what you're saying. This is the reason why we use examples and analogies and illustrations when we give the gospel to people. We, we read God's word. And if you're a good soul, what you'll be doing is saying, Okay, you know, we start off in Romans 3.23, typically. I mean, you can start off in other places. I usually start off by soul winning in Romans 3.23. Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Right off the bat, when you're trying to instruct someone and teach someone, help them understand, one of the first things I'll say is, well, do you know what a sin is? Because many people don't even know what sin is. 
I mean, I could look at that verse, or you could look at that verse and be like, yeah, that's simple. There's no teaching needed there. It's, it's, it's just, how do you not understand that? But a good teacher is going to make sure that that person understands. And maybe that person does understand it. But your job is to make sure they understand it. And then if they don't, to be able to teach them. Many times I come to people, especially people who maybe don't know English very well. You know, they could speak English, but they don't know it very good. Or younger kids, never been to church. I don't know what a, I have no idea what a sin is. And you have to explain, well, have you ever heard of any God's laws? What do you think God doesn't want us to do? And then they'll say, you know, lying or stealing or killing or whatever, right? Yeah, that's right. That's what a sin is. It's when we're breaking God's rules and you, and you start going through and teaching at that level. Break it down. We use an example of a gift. The Bible says the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Again, a very, a, a very straightforward verse, but you need to be able to break that down and teach it. And say, well, you know, that says gift there and try to help the person understand what a gift is. Now, we all know, everyone knows what a gift is. But the application needs to be made where, it, where it's applicable with, with salvation. So what, what are the, some of the properties of a gift? It's free. It's free of charge. Otherwise, it's not a gift. You know, if you have to pay for it, it's not a gift. It, it's given by someone, and, but you have to accept it in order for it to be yours. right? There's all these different, th different aspects that we point out and just make sure that we're clear in order to teach somebody Oh, I get the concept now. I understand. Eternal life is just, it's just given to me. God already bought it and paid for it. It's done. It, it's bought in full. I just have to accept it. I just have to receive it. And that's what we're trying to get across to people. That's the teaching. And we use different ways to help somebody understand. And if you're going to be a good leader, you need to be a good teacher. You need to be able to un instruct people and break things down at a level that they could understand. And it's not even that it's, it's, it's a lower level. It's just some people just think differently. And there's different people out there. And that's why everybody needs to be out soul winning. It's funny, you know, <laughs> my wife and I, we've been married for over 10 years. And we think about things very, very differently. Very different. I mean, we talk to each other. And if there's a problem at home, just some l random thing, doesn't matter, you know, just some insignificant thing. Or we're talking about changing something in the house, whatever it is. If she gives her explanation of how we should do something, we, you know, we talk about something, we discuss it, try to come up with a plan. I have no idea what she's talking about, and vice versa. And we could be talking to her, just like, I don't know what you mean. And it's like, we have to like draw pictures and stuff to be like, oh, this is what I'm talking about. And, and, and really try to, you know, because our, our communication, just because we're, we, we think really differently about stuff. And there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, everybody thinks differently, and you've got different types of personalities. Some people are very analytical-minded. Some people are, are more you know, creative and abstract thinking. Whatever. God, praise God for making us all different and unique. And there's not, always, there's not only one way usually to skin a cat, right? There's many ways of doing things, and they could all be uh, correct. But in any case, we, you know, again, I'm digressing a little bit. In order to teach, we need to make sure that we're not ignorant. You spend time with Jesus spiritually, he's going to help you to become uh, apt to teach and, and gain more knowledge and understanding. In order to teach well, you, you know, as I was give, you know, explaining before, we need knowledge and wisdom. We need to have a good understanding. Knowledge is when you know something. You know it really well. Uh, and wisdom is being able to apply that knowledge and having the, the full understanding. The Bible says in Malachi 2.7, you don't have to turn there, um, turn, if you would, to, let's see. Turn to Hosea chapter 4. I'll give you some time to get there. I'm going to go over a few other verses here. Malachi 2.7 says, For the priest's lips should keep knowledge, and they should seek the law at his mouth, for he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. So again, it's an Old Testament example of the priest, but essentially that carries over. A New Testament is the pastor. They should keep knowledge. And uh, it says they should seek the law at his mouth. Uh, the, the priest or the preacher should be able to teach very well. 
and uh, be apt to teach. Colossians chapter 1, verse 28 says, Whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom, that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. So that's something in the New Testament that everybody needs to be able to teach every man in all wisdom. 2 Chronicles 1, verse number 10 reads, Give me now wisdom and knowledge that I may go out and come in before this people, for who can judge this thy people that is so great? That was the words of Solomon. And he was asking God as a leader. He is a king. He is just becoming the king of Israel over a great people. And what he's requesting of God is, I need wisdom and I need knowledge. Why? Because he needs to be able to go out and come in and he needs to be the judge and he needs to be able to instruct and to teach and to lead the way. He says, I need wisdom and I need knowledge. And he's asking God for those things. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse number 9. We're getting to Hosea 4 in just a minute. Stay in Hosea 4. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse number 9 says, And moreover, because the preacher was wise, he still taught the people knowledge. Yea, he gave good heed and sought out and set in order many proverbs. So the wise preacher, the wise leader is going to still teach knowledge. Because if you remember in Ecclesiastes 12, he's saying, you know, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. He said, but you know what? Because he had wisdom, he's still going to teach them and instruct and give good heed and set in order many proverbs. As the preacher sought to find out acceptable words and that which was written was upright, even words of truth. The words of the wise are as goads and as nails fastened by the masters of assemblies, which are given from one shepherd. And further, by these, my son, be admonished of making many books, there is no end, and much study is a weariness of the flesh. If you want to be a good teacher, you do need to have knowledge and wisdom. And that is a weariness of the flesh. That's not just something that comes easily. That's something you have to put effort into. Of much reading, it says. Um, Making of many books, there is no end, and much study is a weariness of the flesh. Studying God's word, seeking things out, getting the understanding, that, will, that, is, that is tiring, it's work. But you need to get that work in order to get the knowledge and understanding. You need the knowledge and understanding in order to be able to teach other people the same thing. Uh, Daniel's a great example of, of a leader like this. We've gone over other examples in the Bible depending on different attributes of you know, leaders that are bold. And we looked at David, we looked at other people. Now Daniel's a great example of someone who had a lot of wisdom and knowledge. And he was a great leader. He was promoted in the kingdom to basically be the next in line underneath the, the king, right? He was, he was basically promoted over the whole kingdom. And the reason why is because he had this excellent spirit and because he had so much wisdom and knowledge. I mean, he was someone that was looked to when, you know, as a counselor in all matters. And the Bible says in Daniel 5, 12, for as much as an excellent spirit and knowledge and understanding, interpreting of dreams and showing of hard sentences and dissolving of doubts were found in the same Daniel. Dissolving of doubts comes from someone who has a lot of wisdom and knowledge and is able to instruct other people because when you know something, you're going to be confident in what you're teaching, right? When you know something really well, you've done something, you know, in, in my line of work or whatever your line of work is, you've been doing something for years and years and years and years. You know it. You know it like the back of your hand. You can do it inside and out, you know. You're going to have, if someone were to ask you a question, or if you wanted to teach someone how to do what you do, you will have, the, the confidence is just going to come out because you know it. There is no question. There is no doubt. You dissolve the doubts of the person who's asking you the question because you know what you're talking about. And a good leader is going to dissolve the doubts of people questioning or wondering, you know, and, and in a church, no one should be, you know, doubting or questioning, well, is, is the pastor, is the preacher, does he really know the Word of God? Does he really know the Bible? He just, he talks and sounds like he's never even really read the book. That's a bad leader. And if, and, you know, it's one thing to sound like that, but if they, if they really are like that, then that's really bad. <laughs> they shouldn't be a leader then. Because then they're a novice. If you don't know the Word of God, and your job is to teach the Word of God, that's a novice. And they're not even qualified at that point. You need to be able to, you know, and this is different than having a disagreement with someone. Not everyone is going to agree on every single thing that the Bible says. But there's a difference between disagreeing with someone on Scripture and someone who just doesn't know the Scripture. 
But Daniel's a great example of someone who had a lot of wisdom, a lot of knowledge, a lot of insight, and able to dissolve doubts. And when Daniel spake, people listened because of that knowledge that he possessed. Hosea chapter 4, look at verse number 6. The Bible says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee, that thou shalt be no priest to me. Seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget thy children. And we've got a lot of things tied in here, but obviously knowledge and wisdom are just important in and of themselves anyways. Like you just need to have knowledge just not to be destroyed, to be able to make wise choices and, and decisions and, and, and not get yourself in a big mess. But the other benefit of, of gaining knowledge and wisdom, of course, is then to be able to teach other people and instruct others. When you realize the right ways, when you realize what God's Word says, you can teach that to your children. You can teach that to new converts. You can teach that to anybody else that you come into contact with because hopefully you're reading and understanding and learning and knowing this for yourself. Um, Let's turn to, we're almost done. Turn to Hebrews chapter 5. over that. A good leader is going to be one that's already learned the milk and the meat of God's word and has been putting it into practice. In order to be a good teacher and to teach other people, it's not just enough to gain the understanding and the knowledge. You need to be putting it into use. It needs to be part of your life. It needs to be a regular, you know, it, because if you know it, it's kind of like, do you even really believe it if it's not part of your life, if it's not something that you're, you're actively doing? You know, you could, you could have this head knowledge of things, but do you, are you really trusting that to be right and true? And the problem is when, when you don't, it, when you learn something and, it, and it's not incorporated in some way into your life, that, that truth, you're going to end up forgetting that. The Bible says, let's look at Hebrews, you know, because the, the Bible says in James, that, uh, um, you know, be careful not to be a, a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. Because if you're not a doer of the work, what that's implying is that you will be a forgetful hearer. You can hear the truth, you can see the truth, you can understand the truth, but when you're not doing it, you're going to forget about it. It's going gonna, it's gonna to go out of sight, out of mind, and it's like you never even learned it to begin with. And then if you don't know it, how can you teach other people? Uh, Hebrews chapter 5, look at verse number 12, the Bible says, for when for the time ye ought to be teachers. And again, this is something that everybody ought to be. This is, he's talking to people, you know, for the time, for as long as you've been saved, for as long as you've been going to church, for as long as you've been at this, you ought to be teachers. You ought to have learned and grown enough to be able to teach other people. This is incumbent upon everybody here to be able to learn and grow and have enough wisdom and knowledge at some point to be able to be a teacher. It may not be today. You may still be receiving the milk of the word. You may still need to grow a little bit more and understand more and gain more knowledge. But at some point, he says, there's a time you need to, also, you need to then become a teacher. Just like when we have children physically, hey, it's great when they're children. They, they need to learn. They need to grow. They need to understand a lot of things. We need to teach them a lot of things. But there's going to come a point when they need to be an adult, when they're going to live their own life. And they're going to they're gonna leave the nest and, and, and go and live their life. They're, they're need, there should be that point in people's lives. Just as much spiritually. You need to get to the point where you grow enough to be a teacher, to be able to instruct other people, to know the Bible well enough to be a teacher. The Bible says, for, when, for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. And he's rebuking people who have just been around for a long time. And he's like, you don't even know the basics. Like, you should be teaching people and you just need milk. You're like a little baby. We need to feed you with milk. You can't even handle meat. Because you just don't have any knowledge. 
He says in verse 14, he says in verse 13, for everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. Babies drink milk. Verse 14, but strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Now I'll focus in on that verse there because he's saying, you know, those that are of full age that are able to handle the strong meat and actually able to, to really consume and, and understand the deeper things and the hidden things and, and uh, just, just, just have more wisdom knowledge. He says, those who by reason of use those are the people who can receive the meat. It's when you're using it, when you're putting it into practice. Those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern. Discerning both good and evil, that's having wisdom. Understanding the right from wrong and being able to make the right choice in your situations, that's having wisdom. You get that wisdom by exercising what you already know and putting it into practice and using it. And not just locking yourself in a study and just, re you know, hey, I, I'm all for reading the Bible. But if you just spend all of your time just reading, 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 studying, 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 reading, you're going to become imbalanced. And the things that you, you know, you're going you're gonna to reach a point of just kind of spinning your wheels. Because you need to start exercising what you learn in order to keep building on that. Bible says in uh, you know, my, my last two points here, you turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. It's the last place I'll be turned, 1 Corinthians chapter 14. To be a good teacher, we need to know what we're talking about. We need to have wisdom. We need to have knowledge. You don't have to have some degree. You don't have to have some pedigree. You just need to, to get in whatever it is you're learning. And in our case, we're focusing mostly on the Bible, on God's Word. You need to know what you're talking about. But another thing you need to be able to do is to make difficult concepts easy to understand. I already gave you the soul winning explanation, you know, of a gift of really breaking things down. But that, that really is one of the keys to being a good teacher. Habakkuk 2, verse number 1 says, I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower and will watch to see what he will say unto me and what I shall answer when I am reproved. And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain upon tables that he may run that readeth it. He's saying, write it down. And just, he said, make it plain. Make it obvious. You know, write it down on this table. Make sure that, that whoever sees it, you can read it and just understand it and run with it and go with it. We need to make things just easily understood. That's why, you know, you know who's not a good teacher? Is the, 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 the Calvinist or whatever that wants to throw around. I use Calvinist because people who are Calvinist typically are just really into this intellectualism of using big words and, you know, my soteriology lines up with my eschatology and, you know, you start talking in, in the Hebrew language, it says this, but in Greek, it's, a, you know, and, and they're going to start throwing things at you and you're just like, what are you talking about? A good teacher isn't there to try to impress you with their knowledge. Oh, I know all these big words. You should, uh, you should, if you could hear the vocabulary that I have, mm, then you're really going to lift me up. And that's what these people are doing. They just like the praise of men. They want to be looked to as someone who's this expert and really, well, you really know everything and you're so smart. And so many of these fools aren't even saved. <laughs> they aren't even saved. They're using the big words. They're supposed experts. And they don't even know the most basic things. For the time they ought to be teachers, they need someone to teach them. No, salvation is not of works. And no, believing on Jesus isn't a work either. You, you've gone too far into your study when you start thinking that receiving a gift is a work or asking God to save you is a work. You need someone to teach you again. You're not a teacher. You need to learn the basic things. We need to make things plain. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Now, I understand. 1 Corinthians 14, just, just so we're clear about this, the context is talking about speaking with other tongues. Okay, in 1 Corinthians 14, he's talking about spiritual gifts, but the application we're going to make is still going to stand because it makes sense. Okay, what he's going to say here, the truth that he's going to say about this, 
and is, is going to make sense. So when we're teaching other people, th w these verses are going to, you'll see how it's going to fit in. But I just want to make sure you understand, because we're only reading a few verses, that when you read 1 Corinthians 14, he's talking about things being done decently and in order within the church. And if someone is able to, you know, speaks in another language, that, that it's not this free-for-all like it is in the Pentecostal churches, but, uh, which isn't even speaking in tongues because it's just babbling. But um, he's telling us here, look at, well, let's just read it. Verse number nine. We'll read it and then, and then give the understanding. Verse number nine. The Bible says, So likewise ye, except ye utter by the tongue words easy to be understood. How shall it be known what is spoken? For ye shall speak into the air. He's saying you need to, you know, when, when you're teaching people, don't use the big words or the language that someone's not going to be able to understand. Because you're not doing anyone any good at that point. No one cares about your vocabulary if they don't even know what the word means. You're not benefiting them anymore. You know, and, and by the way, as a teacher and as a leader in church and spiritual things for sure, you're not there for you. The pastor is, I'm not here for me. I'm here for you. I'm here to help you out. This is, I, I, you know, and if I am here for me, I'm here for the wrong reasons. And again, I shouldn't be in this job then. Because the leader or the teacher isn't there for their own exaltation. In the world, you might find people like that. I mean, you, you look at the president, right? Yeah, he, he wants the, the praise of men. He wants the glory of men. He wants people exalting him. Sure, I get that. But not in the house of God. That's why, you know, many times you'll see a, a pastor preacher is called a minister. Why? Because you minister to other people. You help other people out. The job or the role of being a leader in church, and we're going over leadership stuff, and we're going to teach this more in preaching class as well for any man that want to come. Just get this understanding. Leadership in church means you're a servant. Leadership means it's not about you. You're filling a role. It may be a very important role, but it's not about you. It's about the service. It's about the job. If you want to be a good leader, you need to be a good teacher. If you're going to be a good teacher, you need to realize it's not about you. You need to be able to speak in language that's going to be easily understood by everybody. You can gain the meaning. Oh, yeah, that makes perfect sense to me. Hey, here's this word in the Bible, or here's this concept. I'm not quite getting this. Okay, Let's, let's just break it down and just make this really easily understood. I'm not going to use some, some language that's from some book, from, you know, from somebody just to, to show off some knowledge that I have. I'm just going to give you that. And, and even if it's right, there's, it, it doesn't matter. If you can't understand it, it doesn't matter. It doesn't do you any good. Just as much as what 1 Corinthians 14 is really talking about if I come up here and I, I, you know, I have this great message, the Spirit's on me, man, I'm going to preach this powerful sermon, but it's in a language like Chinese that nobody here knows or understands, it's going to do nobody any good. It's the same way with using any other type of language or any vocabulary that people don't know. It's not going to do anyone any good. Verse number 10, it says, There are, it may be, so many kinds of voices in the world, and none of them is without signification. Therefore, if I know not the meaning of the voice, I shall be unto him that speaketh a barbarian, and he that speaketh shall be a barbarian unto me. He's just saying, like, we're just not going to understand each other. Communication isn't there. You're not teaching. So, we all ought to strive to be good teachers. Leadership's a good quality to have for everybody. Everyone, at some point in your life, in, in one way or another, you're going to need to be able to lead. But even this specific quality, this goes beyond just a leadership quality, being able to teach people. We're, we're learning and studying from God's Word so we can teach other people the Word of God. Why? To help them. I assume you're here because you, so everyone here should have been benefited by God's Word. I know I've been benefited. If for no other reason than the fact that you have eternal life. Has that benefited you? It's benefited me. I'd like to be able to teach and show other people how they can be benefited by it too. But it's more than just eternal life. It's every aspect of life. There's so much wisdom and knowledge. Let's learn this for ourselves. Yes, for our own betterment. But then also to learn how to be a good teacher so we can help other people. And help them out along the way. And be a good minister to them. That's what Christ was doing. He had all knowledge. 
He was going around and teaching people. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for all the instruction that you've given us in your word. God, I pray that you please help us to raise up more leaders, especially spiritual leaders, dear God, that can help and just go to other areas and just teach more people um, the words of life and the words of truth to be able to go forward and, and preach the gospel and to um, and commit everything that they've learned unto other faithful men and we could just continue to, to get this thing going and, and to reach just as many people as possible and be able to preach the gospel to every creature. God, I pray that you please bless our church. Uh, fill this church with people that, that you lead here and, and will um, that want to grow, that want to serve you, that, that have the same spirit and the same heart to... Uh, to, to do your will. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.